Okay, so chapter seven, thermochem. Um, it, I think this will be refreshing. It's new material. So that's kind of nice. We've made it through what I think we covered most of in intro chem. And so thermochem, a little bit next chapter with quantum mechanics, um, we're going to start to see some new material. So thermochemistry, um, it's just another part of re reaction and equation writing. So what thermochemistry is going to really look at is the energy of reactions. Um, so there's a couple of things in thermochem that tend to cause some trouble. I'll point those out when we get there. Hess's law seems to be the big one. I have to admit, I don't, I don't understand it. To me, thermo was like an easier chapter. I always thought this just kind of made sense. So I'll do my best to explain it. Um, but with energy, where this begins, we've seen a lot of these definitions already, but you know, kinetic energy being the energy of movement and motion, potential energy is the energy of position holding a ball six feet in the air, classic example, right? Has great potential energy if you go to drop it. Thermal energy, thermal, right? We think temperature, so it is our energy of motion because temperature is basically measure of molecular motion. Now, chemical energy, that's a potential energy. So we'll look at that more with heats of formation, but essentially as a reaction proceeds, the reactants on the left side of the equation, they have certain bonds that have to be broken and new bonds will be formed. And so we're gonna learn that bonds, if bonds are broken, that requires energy to occur. So you always have this uphill climb in terms of energy. You have to go in and break up stable molecules. And then as those new molecules and compounds form, then energy is released. And so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail when we get to exo and endothermic reaction you know, uh, diagrams. Um, internal energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy per system. Those are all just sort of definitions to kind of take a look at, but um, no numbers just yet. Um, now, our units of energy, we are probably very familiar with calories. Um, and technically, if you look at your nutrition labels, you'll notice that calorie should be, if it isn't, but it, it is abbreviated with a capital C rather than a little c. And I don't know why, I don't know who decided to do this. If you go over, like I've been to Ireland twice, and they have their units as kilocalories, which is, is really more accurate. Um, when we measure our nutritional information and, and our energy, it's really measurement of kilocalories. So if we say we burn 2000 calories a day or whatever, we're actually saying 2000 kilocalories. Um, but if you notice on our nutrition labels, they usually will uh, change it from kilocalorie to calorie with a capital C, not to be confused with calorie with a little c. Um, I think that's not, I don't know. I don't know why we can't just put kilocalorie, but whatever. So there's a, another unit that we often use in chemistry, which is joules or kilojoules. And that's actually what we prefer, I think, for chemistry. Uh, that's the one I've always used is joules and kilojoules, but it's another unit of energy, just like we can measure length in inches or centimeters, right? So same thing here, we can measure energy in calories or joules, but you'll see in this, this chapter, it's typically joules or kilojoules. And the relationship between those two is one calorie little c, not kilocalorie, but actual calorie, one calorie is 4.184 joules. Um, so we will want to remember that. I put that next to it. I'm going to highlight it. I bolded it, but you definitely want to remember that conversion, just like, uh, like I mentioned earlier, one inch is 2.54 centimeters. So a calorie is defined as the amount of energy, calorie with a little c, to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So then I talk about the calorie, right? With the capital C, capitalized. Anyway, that's all there, but it's just, I don't know. You don't need to know that. I just find it interesting. Okay, so law of conservation of energy that as a, a reaction occurs, right? Energy cannot be created or destroyed. There is a system and there is a reaction and there are surroundings, right? So if the reaction as we talked about, you break bonds, energy is required, you create new bonds, energy is released. That energy isn't just created and destroyed. It has to come from somewhere. It has to go from some, go to somewhere, right? So we'll talk about that when we talk about doing reactions in test tubes and why sometimes as we do those reactions, the test tubes get hotter or colder. So that's what we'll look at, um, that conservation of energy and how it applies to the system and the surroundings. All right, so first law of thermo, uh, thermodynamics is the study of energy. First law says that the total energy of the universe is constant and energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's like, when I remember learning that, I was like, yeah, okay. I, I like numbers. Just give me some numbers to work at. All right, heat. 
Um, so normally when we think heat, we think temperature, but those are not the same thing. So heat is a form of energy where we are gonna use the units of calories and joules. Whereas temperature, we know those units are Celsius, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, right? And so they are different. Um, so when we talk about heat, it's, it's this energy of the system and the surroundings. And the thermal energy, that energy of motion within the molecules. Um, so when we look at reactions, we're gonna be looking at that specifically, right? Because we're applying this to, to chemical equations, reactions. So energy, again, breaking bonds, forming new bonds, we'll look at what are called heats of formation for compounds. Um, so we're gonna be looking at heats of reactions. And so we'll get to that in just a little bit. First page there, mostly definitions. So now I like to start looking at numbers. Now the heat capacity is where we start when we do our thermo chapter. And what we are, I think, very aware of is that there are certain substances that require a lot of energy to start changing their temperature. Um, water is a perfect example, right? You go to boil water on the stove, it seems to take forever. <laughs> Whereas the pot that's holding that water heats up much faster. Um, so that, that is the difference between being a conductor and an insulator, right? So the metals, like we learned, those are good conductors of energy. So that pot that we put on the stove, that heats up quickly when we start applying heat. It conducts that energy. That's why they're great you know, for cooking food. The water is an insulator. Um, so the water takes a lot more energy to start increasing its temperature. And we'll see that when we get to um, what are called heat capacities or specific heat capacities. So what's the difference? The heat capacity is looking at a system and we will use that a little bit, um, not a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that when we talk about calorimeters. Um, a specific heat capacity, that is of a substance. So I, the way I kind of remembered it was, oh, it's a specific substance. I don't know, that, uh, to me that uh, simplified it, but I was like, okay, so what like specifically talk about water or specifically let's talk about steel, something like that. So that's a specific heat capacity that's substance specific. And water, for example, has a heat capacity of, uh, sorry, a specific heat capacity of 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. So what that says, if I take one gram of water and I raise the temperature one degree Celsius, I need 4.18 joules. And if you remember from the previous page, that was equal to a calorie. Now, something like um, lead, right? a metal, right, a good conductor of energy, that specific heat capacity is so much less, so much lower. It takes much less energy to start raising the temperature. And that's what we were just talking about. Lead is gonna be a good conductor, very low specific heat capacity, whereas water is an insulator, it's gonna have a much higher specific heat capacity. So the higher the specific heat capacity for the substance, the more energy it's gonna to take to start changing that temperature, right? So, um, the, the two formulas that follow, all right, so you wanna, you wanna look at these formulas here. Um, this is that difference again between the heat capacity for a system and the specific heat capacity for a substance. So the system, what you'll notice is, is it has a heat capacity and it'll have the heat capacity defined for the system. So where does this come in? So like if we are doing a reaction and we wanna actually know the energy released or absorbed by this reaction, we can put it, like if it's a combustion reaction, we can put it in what, to what's called a bomb calorimeter. It's a closed system. We can put the reaction there. They also measure nutritional information this way. They can put whatever the food item is in it. And they can go through this reaction and determine the energy of this reaction. And that energy is measured by this calorimeter, which is a system. It's a container. Um, sometimes, you know, I mean, they get really fancy, obviously, but when we when in when we're in lab, we use like we, we use like styrofoam cups because they work really well. Um, I, I have done labs before where we use like um, the old thermos containers from when I was a kid. Like, I don't know if we even still have those. <laughs> now they're all metal and insulated, but like your water bottle, your insulated water bottle, something like that would work. So it's this heat capacity of the system. So it's, it's this bottle or whatever it is that they've measured. Okay, well, if, if that change in, if the temperature of that water bottle or that calorimeter has gone up by one degree, this is how much energy has been required to change that temperature. So that's a heat capacity for a system. Now, if it's a substance, 
what is also going to be what is also going to matter is what mass do we have if it's a if it's a system like the insulated water bottle that insulated water bottle it's not like the mass is going to change it is what it is right so that's that heat capacity for that system is measured based on that particular water bottle or whatever it is you're using where if you're talking about a substance like water i mean we talked about it if you want to change the temperature of water you have to ask yourself a couple questions Number one, how much of a temperature change do you want to accomplish? Are you only trying to go up 10 degrees Celsius or are you trying to go up 50 degrees Celsius, right? More temperature change, you're going to need more energy. That makes sense. That's number one. And number two, the other question is, well, how much do you have? Are you just doing like a cup of water or are you doing a gallon of water, right? So if it's specific to a substance, then the formula changes a little bit. We need the specific heat capacity for the substance. Like we saw water was 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. We need to know what kind of a temperature change we're going to accomplish, and we need to know how much water we have to heat up. The calorimeter, the system, the only thing that matters there is what kind of a temperature change we're going to have. Now, the where do we get these values, these constants? We don't we don't have to memorize these, right? So that's rule number one. Don't memorize any of your heat capacities. So the heat capacity for a substance like water or lead, the 0.128 and the 4.18 for water. These are given, but they're tabulated. They're easy to look up and Google, right? So you can, you can find those specific heat capacities pretty readily. The system, this one is always gonna have to be given because the system is, it could be anything. Like we talked about, it could be the styrofoam cup system that I mentioned, or it could be your insulated water bottle system, right? Whatever that calorimeter is. So the C, is going to be very different here. And the way that you'll recognize the difference is by the units. In this case, right, the Q, and I don't, I don't know why Q is the unit for heat, although H is enthalpy. So I understand you don't want to use H for heat because it's enthalpy, but Q is heat. Um, and we know that the unit there is in joules. So the, the C here is going to be have units of joule per degree Celsius. So if I have my joule divided by degree Celsius times degree Celsius with my change in temperature, that's going to get me to joules. With the heat for a specific substance, your Q is still joules because it's still heat. But now your specific heat capacity is going to have units of joule per gram degree Celsius. So that's how you're going to notice like what, what you have to look for. So in this first one with the system, with the calorimeter, you can tell by the units, because of the units here, you only are going to need delta T, right? To cancel out the degree Celsius. And with the specific heat capacity for the substance, you'll probably see it in the language, right? We're talking specifically about water or specifically about lead. Now we're gonna need to know the mass, right? And the delta T. So we're gonna have to know two things for the substance. All right, so here's an example. How much heat in joules does it take to raise the temperature of 814 grams of water from 18.0 to 100.0 degrees Celsius? And that specific heat of water or specific heat capacity, I, I kind of use both interchangeably, uh, interchangeably is 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. So this is a specific substance. We've got water, so we're using the second formula here. And we can also see that from the units, right? We've got joules, Mass is important and temperature change is important. So this formula, a lot of times I refer to it as the MCAT formula. I think I heard somebody call it that once and I said, oh, okay, that kind of makes it easy to stick. There's no A, just that delta, which means change. That kind of makes it look like an A, so it's an MCAT formula. So M is our mass, right? We have 814 grams of water. The specific heat capacity for the water is 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. And our change in temperature, we always want to take final minus initial. So this is TF for final, TI for initial. So our final temperature is 100.0 degrees Celsius. And if we minus out the initial of 18.0, keeping that decimal place, we'll get a temperature change of 82.0 degrees Celsius. All right, and so now we're ready to just plug into the formula. So we have our mass of 814 grams, our specific heat capacity of 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius, and our temperature change was 82.0 degrees Celsius. 
Now with the temperature change, you do wanna keep track of the units because you could have energy going in absorbed or you could have energy being released because it's cooling down and that energy is going somewhere else. Um, so you do always make sure you go final minus initial. So on my calculator, I'm gonna take 814, multiply by 4.18, multiply by 82. And um, you get a very large number. I'm gonna type it in one more time just to make sure I didn't miss anything. All right, and we wanna keep three sig figs. Calculator gives me 279007 joules. So scientific notation, or we can round it to 279,000 joules, or you could say 279 kilojoules, or you could say 2.79 times 10 to the remember going one, two, three, four, five to the left, so positive five joules. So whichever one of those three ways you wanna express the answer is fine. All right, so we've got our amount of energy required to raise the temperature of 814 grams of water, um, 82 degrees Celsius. We wanna increase it 82 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's our specific heat capacity formula. Now let's try one with lead. We're gonna take a 454 gram block of lead. As we talked about, metals are good conductors, so that specific heat capacity is much, much less. It's 0.128 joule per gram degree Celsius. It's at an initial temperature of 22.5 degrees Celsius, we wanna know what the temperature would be after it absorbs 4.22 kilojoules of heat. All right, so again, you kind of look at the units here and you recognize that we need the mass and delta T. So this formula is the same formula as the MC delta T or MCAT. In this case, the heat is given. We've got 4.22 kilojoules, so that's our Q. Mass is 454 grams. The specific heat capacity is 0.128 joule per gram degree Celsius, right? Different substance, so different specific heat capacity. And in this case, we're gonna first solve for delta T, all right? So we're gonna put a question mark there and then we'll come back and figure out um, what our final temperature is, which is really what we're looking for. One quick thing to note is, is that I've got kilojoules and in my specific heat capacity, I just have joules. So the first thing I'm gonna do is multiply my kilojoules by a thousand since there's a thousand joules in a kilojoule. So this is really 4,220 joules. All right, so now I'm ready to plug in. Since I'm solving for delta T, I'm gonna divide both sides by MC. So I've got my Q of 4,220 joules, my mass of 454 grams, and my specific heat capacity of 0.128. And this will get me to my delta T. All right, so 4,220 divided by 454 divided by 0.128, keeping three sig figs. I'm gonna just type it in one more time. And I got 72.6 degrees Celsius for my delta T. All right, so that's my change in temperature. So if you kind of look at this really quick, the water went up 82 degrees Celsius. The lead is going up. I mean, it's not too far off. It's 72.6 degrees Celsius. Now, granted, my mass, you know, not quite as much as what we had for the water, but look at the energy difference. Instead of 279,000 joules, only 4,000 joules were used for this. So you can see a lot less energy is required to raise the temperature of a good conductor like lead. All right, now we're not done yet. The reason is we wanna know what the temperature of the lead will be after it absorbs. So remember delta T is final minus initial. And it says that the initial temperature was 22.5 degrees Celsius. So if I'm gonna solve for the final temperature, I'm gonna add initial temperature to both sides. So I'm gonna take the 72.6 and add it to the 22.5. So, and it makes sense, we're raising the temperature, so the temperature should be going up. So I get a final temperature here of 95.1 degrees Celsius. All right, so that'll be our final temperature of the lead after putting 4,220 joules of energy on that 454 gram sample of lead. So both of those examples looked specifically at a substance. The first one, of course, was water. And that specific heat capacity of 4.18, right, that's given. 
Then the second one looked at the specific heat of lead, right? And that, again, that heat capacity is given. Those are the C, I always remember when I was learning this, I remember, okay, C is my constant, right? That's the, the constant for the substance. So that's given to us. And then the Q is your heat, all right? And mass, obviously we're familiar with. And then the other thing is just your delta T is always final minus initial. And yes, it can be negative, right? It could be cooling down and it can be heating up. It can go either way. In both of these examples, the substance was being heated up. So the heat, the Q was positive, that's energy being absorbed, um, but it could have gone the other way. We could have been cooling down the lead and it would be how much energy is released, in which case it would just be a negative sign. But we'll look at that more as the chapter goes on. All right, so if we go then to the next page, um, we've got, now we're gonna put kind of two things together. Now, as I was talking about before with a calorimeter, it's a closed system. This is like going back to what I was talking about with the insulated water bottle that you can use to measure the specific heat of a substance. You can use to measure heats of reactions. They can be used in a lot of different ways. So, um, and then a bomb calorimeter, a bomb calorimeter specifically looking at combustion reactions. So this first example, we won't be looking at the calorimeter, but the second example we will. This first example is actually very similar to what we're gonna do in lab when we do our thermal lab, where we're gonna take a piece of metal, we're gonna put it into a, a dry test tube, we're gonna put that test tube into a water bath and we're gonna start boiling the water. Um, and so the metal's gonna stay dry because it's inside of a dry test tube, but it's gonna heat up because it's, it's in that water bath. Um, so the metal gets really hot, we carefully take it out of the test tube and pour it into room temperature water that's in a calorimeter, which is in lab, just two styrofoam cups with a lid. And what'll happen is that room temperature water is obviously going to heat up by the hot metal and the hot metal is going to cool down. And eventually they're going to get to an equilibrium point where the final temperature is the same for both, right? So neither is going to heat up or cool down anymore because they're at the same temperature. And what we're going to do in lab is use the data that we take, our initial temperatures, our final temperatures, our mass of metal, our mass of water, and we're gonna determine the heat capacity for the metal. Um, so that's what this example is gonna do. So I'm gonna put a little note here there, right next to it that we're doing this in lab. This is the first part of the thermo experiment that we're gonna do. So if you wanna look back and look at this example, you've got another example. So we've got a 23.9 gram sample of iridium metal. It's heated to 89.7 degrees. So that's the initial temperature for the metal. So I'll put parentheses metal. It's dropped into 20 grams of water that's in that calorimeter. The temperature of the water goes from 20.1. So that's the initial temperature for the water to 22.6 degrees Celsius. So that's the final temperature. But like I talked about, that's for the metal and the water because both of them get to the same temperature at the end, right? Because then that's when they stop changing temperature. And from this, we want to know the specific heat of the metal. All right, so there's two things that are going on here, right? Now, again, here, if this question were on the test, I would have given the specific heat capacity for the water is 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. I just didn't put it in this example because we just had it on the last example, so I didn't, I didn't repeat it. But if it were a test question, I would give it to you. All right, so... There's a couple of different ways to do this. I always did this in, in kind of one formula, um, but it might be easier to break it up and go step by step because that's how the lab does it. So that's how I'm going to do it here. It might take an extra one extra, you know, like five seconds. It's not a big deal. We can do it in one step or we can do it this way. So we're going to go ahead and do it this way. So the first thing is we're trying to solve for the specific heat of the metal. So we're going to start with the water. So the first thing is we're going to find the Q for water. So what we're going to need is the mass of the water, the heat capacity for the water, and the delta T for the water, right? Because that's our formula. That's our MCAT formula. So we had 20.0 grams of water, our specific heat capacity, 4.18 joule per gram degree Celsius. And our change in temperature, final minus initial for the water, 22.6 minus 20.1. Let me just get that, 2.5. Now, the, the, remember here, when you're doing that subtraction, we want to follow the decimal place rule. So we lost a sig fig, but I mean, we can't do anything about it. That is what it is. So our change in temperature, 2.5 degrees Celsius. All right. So 2.5, multiply that by 4.18, and multiply that by 20. And 
we get a change in temp or sorry, a heat of 209 joules. So there's our Q. Now, because of the two sig fig temperature change, right? This is only two sig figs. I'm going to go ahead and round that 209 to 210 to keep it also with just two sig figs, right? So we have 210 joules. Um, that was the amount of energy that was absorbed by the water. Where did that energy come from? It came from the hot metal. That hot metal cooled down, released its energy to the water. The water molecules, right? They took in that energy. They start moving faster. Their temperature goes up. So the second thing to kind of make sure and, and it makes sense here is that in a calorimeter, there's an assumption that energy is not lost to the air or to the surroundings, that it's a closed system. So all of the energy that came into the water was released by the metal. So sometimes that's not perfect, um, but we're gonna make that assumption when we do these kinds of problems that you know the metal is completely submerged. It's not like part of it is sticking up above the water level where some of that energy would be lost to the air. So we just make these assumptions that all the energy lost by the metal is all the energy absorbed by the water. So the Q for the metal is equal to the Q for the water with one small difference. The water is heating up, so the Q is positive. The metal is going to cool down, so the Q is going to be negative. All right, so that shows, right, if it goes one direction, it's positive. If it goes the other direction, it's negative. So we're going to see that a lot when we do enthalpies of reactions. So the Q for the metal is negative 210 joules, right? That energy that was absorbed by the water was the energy released by the metal. So now our final step here is to determine our specific heat capacity for the metal. So if we use the formula Q equals MC delta T, then if we divide both sides by M and delta T, we can solve for C. All right, so I'm gonna take my negative 210 joules, the mass of the metal, 23.9 degrees Celsius. And, oh, sorry, I don't know why I put 23.9 degrees Celsius. I meant grams, there we go. 20, ignore the degree sign, 23.9. Um, and our change in temperature for the metal, let me put that over here. All right, so what you'll notice is if we go with the formula, right, final minus initial, the final temperature, here's the other thing you gotta remember that final temperature is the same for both substances. So they both ended up at 22.6 degrees Celsius. The metal started at 89.7. So it's gonna be negative, but that's right, because it's cooling down. So 22.6 minus 89.7, we get a change of negative 76.1. Sorry, the decimal kind of has to get put in there. Sorry, 67.1 negative degrees Celsius. All right, and then what makes sense is your negatives are going to cancel out. Um, so your heat capacities can't be negative, your constants. So the negative and the negative cancel out. So now I've got 210 positive divided by 23.9 and divided by 67.1 positive. So the answer I get here to two sig figs is 0.13 joule per gram degree Celsius. All right, so that would be our heat capacity for the iridium metal based on the measurements we did. So the, the experiment we're gonna do in lab is very similar to this. We're gonna have an unknown metal, but we're gonna do the same thing. We start with our metal, we find the mass of it. We have water sitting in our double styrofoam cup calorimeter. We, we know the mass that we've added to the calorimeter. We measure the temperature of the water before we do anything to it. We measure the temperature of the hot metal sitting in the test tube, nice and dry. And um, then we put the hot metal into the room temperature water, put the lid on it, put a thermometer in the lid, and then we see where that tem temperature equilibrates, where it stops moving. And that's our final temperature for both the metal and the water. And then to determine the heat capacity of the metal, you got to start with the water. So we know the mass of water, we know our 4.18 constant for water, we know our change in temperature for water because we know where we ended up and where we started. We can figure out the energy absorbed by the water. What we know is the energy absorbed by the water came from the metal. So the energy or the heat of the metal is negative of what we had for the water. Then we can use our MCAT formula to solve for our heat capacity. So we take our energy Q 
Q divided by mass divided by delta T, and we can get our heat capacity. Okay, so this one, a little more complicated because we've got two substances that are exchanging energy, right? But we just do one at a time. So it's, it's, not, it's not really that much harder, just a couple of things we have to look at. Knowing that the final temperature is the same for both, that's the big thing. And then remembering that the Q for the metal and the water are the same, just opposite sign. So going back to the calorimeter, um, so this is where we might kind of see, and you'll see this in the, in the language. Next example says we've got 23.6 grams of calcium chloride. It's dissolved in water. Um, and that is actually an exothermic process. It releases energy to the surroundings. So the water goes from 25 to 38.7 degrees Celsius. If the heat capacity of the solution and calorimeter combined, so the system is 1,258 joule per gram degrees Celsius. Notice there's no grams in the unit. What is the enthalpy of this change in kilojoules per mole? All right, so first thing is because we have a system, the Q is just equal to C times delta T, right? We don't need mass in this. And again, the units kind of tell us this. So first delta T, final minus initial. Um, oops, I was doing too much at once. Final minus initial, <laughs> there we go. So 38.7 minus 25.0. So we have 13.7 degrees Celsius for our delta T. All right, so delta T, and then times that heat capacity for the uh, calorimeter. So we have 1,258 joule per gram degree, or sorry, not gram, joule per degree Celsius, and then times the change in temperature of 13.7. So if I take 13.7, multiply it by 1258, I get to three sig fig, 17,200 joules, All right? So that was the energy absorbed by this calorimeter system. So where did this energy come from? It came from this dissolving of calcium chloride. All right, so that means that the reaction, right, the Q of, I'll put R for the reaction, is equal to negative Q for the system. So negative 17,200 joules energy release. So here's the big thing, and this will, this will kind of help us as we move forward. When your Q is positive, the energy is absorbed. When your Q is negative, energy is released. All right, and we'll see that as we talk about endothermic and exothermic reactions. So that means when this calcium chloride dissolved, it released that 17,200 joules because that's what was absorbed by the calorimeter. And that was the same assumption we made up here between the iridium and the water. One is losing energy, the other one is absorbing. All right, now what we've got is it says we want to figure out the enthalpy or the heat of the change. So enthalpy and Q are very similar, but we want it in kilojoules per mole. All right, and what do we have so far? We know that there was 17,200 joules released when we used 23.6 grams of calcium chloride because that was given to us in the question. And we need this to get changed to kilojoules per mole. First thing, let's do the joules, because that's easy. 1,000 joules in a kilojoule, all right? So we got the, the unit of energy in kilojoules. The next thing is to get grams into moles, and that looks like molar mass, right? So I'm gonna take calcium 40.08, sorry, 40.08, two chlorine 70.9. So 110.98 grams of calcium chloride per mole of calcium chloride. So I got grams of calcium chloride converted to moles and now I just have to multiply through. So that 110.98 was the molar mass from the periodic table, divide that by a thousand, multiply that by 17,200 negative and then divide that by 23.6. So I get negative 80, let's see, three sig figs, 0.9 kilojoules per mole. So that would be our heat of that reaction or that solution process. All right, um, so when we write this chemical equation, moving forward, we're gonna call this a thermochemical equation. So what's the difference? Um, when you write your chemical equation, that's what we're used to, right? So this is just showing that calcium chloride starts out as a solid and it dissolves in water and the calcium ion dissociates from the two chloride ions. That's a chemical equation. 
So if I change that, I'm gonna write it down here, to a thermochemical equation, all that means is I'm taking that chemical equation and adding the thermo component. So it'll be calcium chloride solid dissolving into calcium ion and two chloride ions. And then we would have here what is called our enthalpy, delta H of the reaction, which is the heat of the reaction, would be negative 80.9 kilojoules per mole. All right, and that's what we figured out when we did our calculations above. So we had a certain amount of calcium chloride, 23.6 grams. When that dissolved, we saw that the calorimeter system absorbed 17,200 joules. That means that dissolving calcium chloride, that 23.6 gram sample, released 17,200 joules. So then to get it just into kilojoules per mole, because that's typically the unit we look for for um, enthalpy, we just change joules to kilojoules real quick, divide by 1,000, and then change mass to moles using molar mass from the periodic table. And so now what we know is for every one mole of calcium chloride that dissolves, we're gonna release 80.9 kilojoules of energy. And so what we'll see moving forward is then how to take that thermochemical part, the enthalpy part, and start doing some stoichiometry. Um, so I saw a question in the chat box about the midterm. So are we talking about the midterm for lab or the midterm for class? Um, let's see. The midterm for lab may not be open yet. And then test two, like in lecture class, we don't have a midterm, we just have test two. And I know that that folder, it may still be hidden. I haven't checked that yet. It shouldn't be. I just was in there this morning, but I'll, I can double check it. But in the lab class, the midterm may not be unhidden yet, but I can do that later today. I can check it. I'll write myself a little note. So David, I saw your question. I'm not 100. I didn't know if you were talking about lab or lecture. Okay, so enthalpy. Oh, okay. For lab though or for lecture? Just want to make sure. For the test two for lecture class, that's going to open next week. It'll be due Friday at midnight. So it'll be open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The reason why I was going to talk more about it is the last day to drop, if I wrote it on the calendar, which I know I did. Yeah, it's Friday. So if anybody in the class is, is thinking, I really need to do well on test two before I decide whether or not I'm going to drop the class, then I want you to take the test Wednesday or Thursday, because I'll grade it Friday so that you can make a decision before the end of Friday, which is when the last, that's the last day to drop. Um, so that's test two for the lecture class. Uh, the lab final is also open next week, but everyone's, you know, for the most part doing really well in lab. So I don't think we're going to have the same issue with lab. Um, drop date is still the same. It's still going to be Friday, but the lab final Let's see, I think it opens, I want to say it's Thursday and Friday, but I, I forgot to put that on my calendar, but I will let you know when I get into lab. Okay, so David, I'll look that up and I will get you an answer when we do our lab Zoom session at 2.30. So I'll have that date for you. Okay, all right, so we've got our enthalpy, delta H, or the heat of the reaction. Um, and what I'm going to look at on the next page is going to go back to what we were talking about, what I've mentioned, this exothermic and endothermic idea. So when energy is released to the surroundings, it is an exothermic reaction, and your delta H will be negative. So this, this reaction right here, the calcium chloride, dissolving that, um, this negative, right, the negative delta H means that this is an exothermic reaction. So the way I remembered it, because I thought it was easy this way, exothermic means it, it, the energy exits the reaction. I don't know why I thought that made it easy to remember. So what's happening here? So we talked about how, you know, when, you, when you're doing, when you're looking at like an energy diagram. So let's say that this over here on my y-axis is energy and on my x-axis, I have like reaction progress. When you start your reaction with your reactants, I'll just say R for reactants, they have a certain amount of like potential energy, right? In their, in their bond structure. And what we have to do is you have to go in and break those bonds, right? So you have, a, you have always start with an uphill climb. You've got to go in and either break up intermolecular forces if you're doing a phase change, or you've got to break bonds if you're doing a chemical change. All right, then 
new bonds or new intermolecular forces are uh, made. And so now there's this release of energy because those broken bits are now restabilizing, right? So they're forming new bonds and they end up, here's my products, P for products, they end up at a lower energy. Um, so when I look at this overall, I have a downhill um, energy process. So overall, like I have to go up the hill a little bit, but when I go down the hill, I go much farther down than I went up. Um, so overall, your energy is released to the surroundings. And when that happens, your delta H is going to be less than zero. It's going to be a negative value, like we talked about with the calcium chloride. If it is an endothermic reaction, it's the opposite. So what I remembered with endothermic is energy flows in to the reaction. So it more energy is absorbed than released is really the way to remember it. Um, but if we're looking at that same energy diagram, I'm gonna abbreviate E for energy, and then I'll just put progress here on the bottom. So now again, we would start at some kind of energy, potential energy, we have an uphill climb to go in and break bonds or intermolecular forces. We form new bonds, so energy drops, and then we end up at some energy point for the products. And so what's different here is where we began versus where we ended up. Overall, we had a net uh, requirement or absorption of energy. So overall, energy is absorbed from the surroundings and your delta H is greater than zero, all right? So this is true for a physical change or a chemical change. Classic example here, if I take water and I wanna turn it into a gas, right? So I wanna boil water, we, we know this, you've gotta heat it, right? You've gotta put energy into it for that to happen. So that's an endothermic process. We're gonna turn on the stove, we're gonna supply that energy those water molecules absorb that energy. They start to move faster. That means their temperature goes up. Eventually they can get to a point where they can break what are called intermolecular forces holding the liquid molecules together. They can break those hydrogen bonds and they can separate and vaporize. Um, so that right there, energy is required for that process to occur. And that is an endothermic reaction. And one of the fundamental things about this chapter is um, is understanding that if it requires energy to go one way, if I go the opposite way, it's the opposite. So if turning liquid water into steam is endothermic, then that means turning steam into liquid water is exothermic. So when you reverse a reaction, you change the delta H, the sign of it. So in this case, for boiling water, right, our delta H would be positive because it's endothermic, but then condensing water, taking it from a gas and turning it into a liquid, that's going to be a negative delta H, opposite sign. All right, so when you reverse a chemical equation, you just change the sign of delta H. And all of that is going to come from the, the energies of formation that we get to at the end of the chapter. So kind of piggyback, piggybacking along that, there's this uh, reaction of oxygen turning into ozone, so O2 going to O3. And this is a thermochemical equation, right? So it's a chemical equation with a thermo added to it. So if I take three moles of oxygen and turn it into two moles of ozone, my delta H is a positive 285.4 kilojoules. So the way that this is written, it says it's going to take 285.4 kilojoules of heat to turn three moles of oxygen into two moles of ozone, right? And because it is a positive delta H, that means that this is an endothermic reaction, right? It, it requires energy to go. So this, the second part of this, that was, that's the given. It says we want to know the enthalpy, which is H, for the reaction of three halves oxygen going to one mole of ozone. So let's see how those compare. I've got three halves oxygen going to one mole of ozone. So when I look at those two equations, how do they relate? Well, the only thing I've done from equation one to equation two is I've multiplied by a half, right? Instead of three oxygens, I've got three divided by two. And instead of two ozones, I only have one. So I had to just multiply by one half. 
All right, so if I'm thinking three moles of oxygen takes 285.4 kilojoules, if I have half as much oxygen, I'm going to need half as much energy. And that's what happens when this is part of Hess's law. If all you're doing with a chemical equation is multiplying the coefficients through by some number, in this case 0.5, then the same thing is going to happen to delta H. So our delta H here would be one half times the 285.4 kilojoules. And so if I go ahead and get that, 285.4 times, whoops, I had something left in the calculator, times 0.5, I get 142.7 kilojoules. So that's how the delta H changes if we change the, the chemical equation. Whatever we do to the chemical equation, we do the same thing to delta H. So like we talked about up here, if we reverse a reaction, we just change the sign of delta H. Or if we multiply through by some number, then we do the same thing to delta H. All right, so th those are two main components of Hess's law. So since we multiplied through by a half, we multiplied our delta H by a half. Now, stoichiometry, right? Now what we are gonna be able to do is take our thermochemical equation and start working some stoichiometry with it. So this is gonna become another part of our stoichiometry flowchart going from an A to a B, mole ratio in the middle, right, that kind of thing. It's just now one of the, either the A or the B could actually be energy because we understand in this reaction how much energy is either required or released. So it says here, what is the enthalpy change, right? So basically what is H? When 12.8 grams of hydrogen reacts with excess chlorine to form HCl. All right, so good thing here is this is not a limiting reactant problem like we've seen. This is just starting out with a certain mass of hydrogen, excess chlorine, we're making this hydrogen chloride. So how much energy am I gonna need or release for this to happen? So first thing, am I absorbing energy or releasing energy? Because the delta H is less than zero, that means that this is an exothermic reaction. So that means that energy is released. All right, so that's the first thing I just kind of, you know, honing in on these things to look for. And what we're basically solving here is, is we're solving for the H. Like we know this H, it's, it's a constant for this reaction, that if I have one mole of hydrogen reacting with one mole of chlorine and I make two moles of hydrogen chloride, I'm gonna release 184.6 kilojoules. I don't have a mole of hydrogen though, I've got more than that. I have 12.8 grams. So now how much energy is released? So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with our, our A, which is the mass of hydrogen, and the B is gonna be our enthalpy. So we have 12.8 grams of H2. Go, go to moles first, that will always, again, lead you to the right direction. So 2.02 grams from the periodic table, adding up two hydrogens, 101 a piece. And here's where this is a new conversion factor. When I look at my delta H value, it says I get net one negative 184.6 kilojoules. And then I have to link that, that to the substance in the equation. So I get this much energy release every time I react one mole of hydrogen. So that's gonna be per one mole of hydrogen. Now, just as a note, I'm gonna show this in pencil and we'll see this in future examples. Let's just hypothetically say that this had had a two in front, then I would have put a two here because that would have been that mole coefficient that I had to take into account for that delta H. But in this case, there wasn't a two in front. It, so that meant it was just one hydrogen every time. Every time I use one mole of hydrogen, I release 184.6 kilojoules. So that's where that conversion is coming from. But your delta H value, you can connect it to any substance in the reaction. It's just in this one, we were looking at the hydrogen. So that's why we put the hydrogen on the bottom. All right, so we got rid of grams of hydrogen. We got rid of moles of hydrogen. We've got our energy. Now we're ready, 12.8 divided by 2.02, .02, and then multiply that by 184.6 negative. And I get to three sig figs, negative 1170 kilojoules of energy released. So that's how much energy or enthalpy would be released if I you know, did the combination reaction of 12.8 grams of hydrogen with excess chlorine. 
So this is a this more stoichiometry, right? But we're adding now this ability to calculate energy, energy change. All right, so we've got more examples coming. Let me do one more and then we'll take a break. Okay, so another example on the next page. So what volume of methane, which is CH4 gas at 25 degrees Celsius and 745 Tor must be burned in excess oxygen to release one times 10 to the six kilojoules of heat. All right, so there's a little bit more going on here. Hopefully when you see the temperature and the pressure, you think, huh, this looks like gas laws, like our last chapter, right? We have temperature and pressure, and it does say methane's a gas. Um, so now let's kind of think about what, we, we, what we're doing here. It says we want to know the volume of the methane, right? So we know that that's our B, right? We know that's what we're going to be solving for. And we have excess oxygen, right? That's good. We don't have to worry about it. And we are releasing, so that means negative, 1.00 times 10 to the 6 kilojoules. So we've, we've released 1 times 10 to the 6 kilojoules. So this is going to act as our A. We know the amount of energy that we've released. We know the amount of energy for the thermochemical equation. So we're going to start with our energy, use our delta H constant to relate it to the amount of methane that must have been burned. And then we can work our gas loss problem. So kind of a complicated step, step here. So we're going to start with our energy. We burn or we release 1.00 times 10 to the 6 kilojoules negative. Based on our thermochemical equation, negative 890.3 kilojoules is released for every one mole of methane. All right, and again, that negative 890.3 Whatever that coefficient is for the methane is what we put here. Since it's a one, it stays a one, All right? So this is how many moles of methane. We want volume and it's a gas. So we're gonna have to stop here like we did in the last chapter to get N. So I'm gonna take one times 10 to the six, divide that by 890.3, the negatives have canceled out. And I have 1,120, Three, I'll round to three sig figs at the end, moles of CH4. All right, so that's my N. Now, since I want volume and it's a gas, I'm going to use Pevner. So I'm going to plug, since, and again, when you see pressure, hopefully you think, okay, I've got a, a Pevner problem. So when I see the 745, I'm going to take 745 divided by 760. Remember, when we use Pevner, it's got to be an ATM. So I have 0 0.980 atmospheres, All right? Temperature 25 degrees Celsius is really 298 Kelvin. So I've got my temperature, I've got my pressure, volume would be NRT over P. So I have my moles, 1123, R, 0 0.08, 206, temperature 298, and then my pressure in atmosphere is 0 0.980. So I'll take the moles, 1123, multiply by 0 0.08206, my R constant, multiply that by 298, and then divide that by 0 0.980. And my volume, I have 28,022 liters. So I'm just gonna type it in one more time, just make sure I did it right. All right, and if I want three significant figures, this is one of those unfortunate scenarios where the only way to do it in three sig figs is, you know, is using scientific notation. If I round it to 28000, that's only two sig figs. So the only way I can do this here is 2.80 times 10 to the one, two, three, four to the left, so positive four. All right, so sometimes that happens where you have to use scientific notation to have the right number of significant figures. It's not often though, but sometimes it does happen. All right, so it's 1210. I think that is a good spot. Uh, if you want, try the next problem on your own because it's gonna be really similar. Um, and then when we come back from break, we'll go over it. And then that way you can see how you did. It's very similar to the problem we just did. Since it's, uh, it's 1211 now, <laughs> I'm gonna wait until 1216. And uh, so everybody has like a quick break. So I'll start back up at 1216.
There we go. Okay. All right. So this the next example here it, it's very similar. So if you tried it during the break, that's fantastic. If you're if you didn't, don't worry about it. But it's it's going to be very similar. We want to look for the volume of HCl. So that's going to be our B. And again, this is reading like a gas law problem. We've got a temperature of 125 degrees Celsius, which would really be 398 on the Kelvin scale. Pressure this time we didn't have to convert 0.971 atmospheres. And we are uh, releasing net 1,575 kilojoules. Um, so remember when it's released, right? That means that the, the sign is negative, right? We've, we've released that energy so that that heat is coming out. So that's why it's a negative. And so this is gonna act as our A, just like the last example. We know how much energy we got out of this reaction. So then the question is, okay, how much stuff did we use, right? Or in this case, how much HDL did we produce? So we released 1,575 kilojoules. Now, one thing I'll say about this that I've noticed is that when it comes to starting with energy, sometimes students don't know if they need to start with the 185 or the 1575. And so I always go back and say, you always start with the measurement, the constants always go in the parentheses, right? In the, in the setup. So like if we go to the last example, that 890.3, that's a constant for this equation. It never changes. That enthalpy is always the same for this reaction. So the constant goes in the parentheses, the one times 10 to the six release, that's, that was only important to this problem, right? So that's always what you start for, that's the measurement. The same thing for this example, we release 1575, that's where we start. That negative 185 kilojoules, that's part of the thermochemical equation. That's a constant. So the constant always goes in the parentheses. So negative 185 kilojoules on the bottom because we need kilojoules to cancel out. And this time we are relating it to HCl. So this is what I was talking about earlier. If there is a molar, let me use uh, my highlighter because I already used that for the other thing. If there is a molar coefficient, you need to make sure and include that when you put in your enthalpy as a conversion factor. So this, the way that this is written, it says we release 185 kilojoules of energy every time two moles of HCl are formed. So that's what we wanna show in this conversion factor that we release 185 kilojoules for every two moles of HCl. All right, so just like we did in the last example, that's going to be our N. So we're going to take the 1575 and divide it by 185 and then multiply that by two. And that tells us that we should have had 17.0 moles of the HCl. All right, so next one, and again, I like to type everything in twice. All right, so the next part of this is the Pivner part because it was a gas, right? We can see that from the reaction, it's gas, we're using a gas loss. So we have our N, P, and T, and we wanna know volume. So volume is N, R, T over P. So we had 17.0 moles according to our enthalpy. R, 0.08, 206, because that's our gas constant. Temperature in Kelvin was 398. And then our pressure in ATM, 0.971. So this will tell us our volume of hydrogen chloride that we produced here. So 17.0 times 0.08206 times 398, and then divide that by 0.971, three significant figures, 573 liters of hydrogen chloride gas must have been produced here as we released that 1,575 kilojoules. All right, so both of those examples there, kind of fun because they bring in the chapter seven thermochemistry part and they also combine it with our chapter six gas laws. So just like we talked about with gas laws in the uh, Zoom session last week on Thursday, anytime you're doing stoichiometry with gases, you know that the formula of choice is Pivner. And you know that this is a gas law problem because you see temperatures and pressures that only happens, especially pressure when it's a gas law problem. So immediately you think, okay, I got a chemical equation, I've got gas laws, I'm thinking stoichiometry, I got to be going through Pivner. So we use our enthalpy release, our thermochemical equation to figure out our moles. That's our N that we can plug into Pivner. And then from there, it becomes a chapter six problem. All right, so um, that's how we do thermochemistry with gases. And again, the big thing here that we're learning is our thermochemical equation, that delta H is acting now like another conversion factor. 
And it's kind of like in the mole ratio. We can see in this equation that two moles of HCl is produced for every one mole of chlorine. And the delta H is telling us that it, uh, 185 kilojoules is released every time we make two moles of hydrogen chloride or every time we consume one mole of hydrogen, right? So this is kind of adding to what we have in our mole relationships. It's just giving us another component, which is the thermochemical, right? The thermo part, all right? Now, the, the last couple of things we have in this chapter, I had mentioned Hess's law, all right? So Hess's law is that one that we've already kind of looked at in a couple of the examples earlier before break, and it's, it's a problem that, I, and again, I don't understand quite why, but it's one that does cause some trouble. Um, so there's a practice quiz on Hess's law. You know, take it, see how you do. We'll, we'll, I'll do my best to explain it. Um, but basically what's gonna happen here um, is you're gonna be given a couple of thermochemical equations where you have the balanced equation and the enthalpy attached to it. And then you'll be given an equation with an unknown enthalpy, but you'll have to figure out how that unknown equation is connected to the, the given. All right, and you'll, you'll see how we do this. And I, I don't know, I always thought these were kind of fun, but that, I, that may not, you may not share that enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, so the couple of rules that we wanna remember here, we saw these before. If you multiply through a chemical equation by a certain N, like the one example we did where we multiplied the oxygen and ozone by a half, then you multiply that delta H by that same half or whatever your N is. So if you double the equation, you double the delta H. If you half the equation, you half the delta H, right? So we talked about that. And the second one is like we talked about for the evaporation of water. If you have a certain reaction and the delta H is positive, if you reverse that equation, everything else stays the same. You've just changed it from reactants and products, products to reactants then the sign of the delta H changes. It either goes you know, positive to negative or negative to positive, depending on where you started. And then if you add reaction equations together, what you wanna keep in mind is if you have like, like substances on reactant and product side, they're going to cancel out. So this goes back to what we did with spectator ions and double displacement reactions, that if you have like terms on both sides of the arrow, you can simplify, you can cancel those out. So that's what we're gonna look at here. So this is what Hess's law problems typically look like. All right, it'll say, we wanna know the delta H or enthalpy for this equation, which is combustion of methane. And we're given the thermochemical equation for carbon monoxide reacting with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. And, um, oh, and I just noticed this. I'm pretty sure that's supposed to be CO2. Hold on, let me think about it really quick. There's my eight, so there's four. Oh no, it's not. Okay, so this is the different reaction. Never mind. It's not just plain combustion. This one's different. And then I've given a thermochemical equation here really quick with methane with oxygen to make the CO2. There's my combustion reaction. <laughs> oxygen to make CO2 and H2O. This one's making carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. So we have these two equations that are thermochemical, we have the enthalpy attached, and we have this third equation where we don't know what the delta H is. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So I'm gonna mark this as equation one and equation two, the two that are given to me. Now we're gonna try to see how this is gonna piece together. The first thing you wanna do is um, you look for what I call discrete substances. In other words, there's gonna be in this first thermochemical equation, a substance that you don't see it in the other thermochemical equation, and it, it is in this target equation. So I call this the target, the one that we don't know. So like the carbon monoxide, for example, here it is in the target equation on the product side. Here it is in this equation one on the reactant side, but it's nowhere in equation two. So that means that when I'm trying to piece together, I'm gonna try to take these two given equations and sort of chop them up and multiply and do whatever I have to, to, and then piece them together to get the target. So you look for discrete substances. So the carbon monoxide is key because it's only coming from equation one. So what, I'm, what I need to do is now manipulate change equation one so that I end up with two moles of carbon monoxide on the product side, all right? So bear with me, all right? I need to, I'm gonna make a little note here. I'm going to, for equation one, 
looking at the carbon monoxide, I need to move carbon monoxide to the product side and I'm gonna to have to multiply it by two. All right, so when I move it to the product side, that means I'm gonna reverse the equation, All right? So I'm gonna change the sign of delta H because that that's what we talked about. And when I multiply by two, I'm gonna multiply the delta H by two, All right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take my carbon monoxide and I'm gonna flip it, All right? So the product carbon dioxide becomes the reactant. And now the two reactants, the carbon monoxide and the half oxygen become the products, All right? So I reversed it. So that means my Delta H here is now gonna be a positive 283.0, All right? So the first thing I did is I reversed the chemical equation, All right? So I took carbon dioxide product, made it a reactant. I took carbon monoxide reactant and made it a product as well as the half oxygen. So the equation is exactly the same. I've, I've copied it, completely copied it over. The only thing that I've done is I've reversed it. And because I reversed it, the sign changed. It went from a negative to a positive. That's all I did so far. Now, the second part of this was when I look at my target equation, I need two moles of carbon monoxide on the product side. And in this equation so far, I only have one. So the second thing I have to do is multiply it by two. So I'm gonna multiply everything by two. So one carbon dioxide becomes two, one carbon monoxide becomes two, and one half oxygen is just gonna become a one. So that becomes a one. And what I'll do with my delta H is I will multiply it also by two. All right, so let me go ahead and get that. So 283 multiplied by two is 566. So really, whoops, wrong head. My delta H now is 566 kilojoules for that thermochemical equation. Now that I've, I've changed my equation one. Now, the second part of this is what am I gonna do to equation two? All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually show equation two up here. I'll, I'll show you why I'm doing this. I'm gonna make my note about equation two here on the bottom. All right, so what do I need to do with equation two? First, look for the discrete substance, right? What is the substance that comes from equation two and it doesn't come from anywhere else, right? So it's in my target equation and in my equation two and nowhere else. And if I look, right, the oxygen is in both equations, so that's not good. And the water, I could use the water. The water is, is discrete, right? Or I can use the methane. Either way, you're gonna get the same answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the methane, but you could have used the water. If I look at water, it's on the correct side, but I'm gonna to have to multiply equation two by two because two times two is four. Methane, it's on the right side, but again, I need to multiply it by two. So I'm gonna go ahead and just track the methane here. All right, so what I'm gonna do for equation two is this time I don't have to reverse it because the methane is on the right side, the water is on the right side. But what I will need to do to go from my given equation to my target is I'm gonna to have to multiply by two. All right, so for equation two, all I need to do is multiply it by two. So what I've got then for equation two is two moles of CH4 gas reacting with, instead of two, it'll be four moles of oxygen gas to make instead of one CO2, two CO2s, and yet I somehow didn't write the two, there we go. And instead of two waters, it'll be four waters, right? And so what does that do to my delta H? Well, it's gonna be the negative, negative 890.3 and multiply that by two. Sorry for squeezing in the two. 890.3 times two, I get, negative 1780.6 kilojoules. All right, so there's my delta H now. So when I take these two equations, I'm gonna put them in a box. Now what I'm gonna to have to do is add them together. All right, and this is where I was talking about how like terms on both sides cancel out. Okay, Excuse so, me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we didn't multiply the methane by two. I did, I think, I hope I did. There's one here and I multiplied it by two. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep on looking all the way at the top. Oh, yeah, no, no, you're fine. That's what we were trying to do. You're right. So I took this equation and multiplied it by two. 
So that's a good, um, good observation. You always want to manipulate the equation that has the delta H attached to it, because then we know what happens to the thermochemical equation. So maybe that's where students get confused. You never can manipulate the target equation. This one, the target equation you leave alone. In fact, you're trying to get your given equations to match the target. So the target stays as is. The only thing we can do is because we have these two thermochemical equations, we can manipulate those to match the target. So the methane in the second given equation only had a coefficient of one and we needed to have a coefficient of two. So we did, we took that second equation, multiplied it by two. So one methane became two, two oxygens became four, one carbon dioxide became two and two waters became four. And now we know what to do with that delta H, negative 890.3, we know multiply it by two, which is what we did and we got negative 1780.6. So now that we've got our two given equations manipulated, right? We, we did what we had to do to try to get stuff on the correct side, right? We were, we were tracking the carbon monoxide, we did that here. In the second equation, we were tracking the methane so now we've got our methane on the proper side. Again, we could have used water instead of methane. It would have worked just as well, All right? But now what we can do is add these two equations together, All right? And this is something we haven't done yet. When you add the two equations together, um, the like terms on either side of the arrow will cancel out. So what I see here is in my first equation, I've got two carbon dioxides on the reactant side. And on my second equation, I've got two carbon dioxides on the product side. So that means I come in with two, I leave with two moles of CO2. So none of this gets used, right? So the carbon dioxide, as long as it's exactly the same on reactant and product side, right? Two and two, not two and three, right? But two and two, they can cancel out. So I, I'm gonna be able to cancel out those two moles of CO2. The next thing I look at is the carbon monoxide, that's gonna stay in place, right? We're not canceling that out because that is that is right where it needs to be. Same with the two moles of methane. The water also stays right where it is. On the product side, we've got four of them that matches what we have on the target. So the last question is the oxygen. I've got four moles of oxygen on the reactant side in equation two. I have one mole of oxygen on the product side in equation one. So I release one or I make one, but I consume four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract one oxygen from both of these. So in the first equation, one oxygen take away one oxygen means it's gonna completely go away. In the second equation, I've got four oxygens and I, I only take away one. So this is gonna become a three, all right? So now if I add my two equations together, together, what I have here is two moles of methane. I'm not gonna worry about the states because I'm gonna run out of room. My other reactant now from four to three oxygens. On the product side, I've got my two carbon monoxides and my four waters, right? And so now that equation matches my target. All right, and I need to get a different color highlighter. Um, but basically, yeah, I don't here. I got a purple pen. Let me use my purple pen. <laughs> Let me get up and get my purple pen. So what I've got now is if I look at my target equation, this is the one I'm trying to figure out my enthalpy for, right? What I should have now, it should match that. So when I look at what I've added together, I've got two methanes, three oxygens two carbon monoxides and four waters, right? And that's exactly what I've got in my target equation. So I have made my equations come together to match my target. So the last thing that we looked at is, okay, what do we do with the delta H's when we add them together? And the great thing is it's, it completely makes sense. You add the delta H's. So Hess's law gives you pieces, right? It says, if you multiply through an equation, then multiply the delta H. If you reverse a, a re, an equation, then you reverse the sign of delta H. If you add reactions together, then you add the delta H's. So in that sense, I always thought Hess's law was really intuitive. Um, so what we did is we took our first equation, we saw the carbon monoxide being the kind of the special thing, right? It's only in this first equation. 
it's on the reactant side, I need it on the product side. So we said, all right, let's reverse the equation. So we did that and we changed the sign on delta H. Then we noticed we need two carbon monoxides, not just one. So we multiplied everything through by two, which meant we had to double the delta H. So that was equation one modified. Equation two, um, it was, it, it, we had the correct reactants and products, but we had to multiply through by two. So we multiplied that equation by two, which means we multiplied that delta H by two. The sign, the sign stays the same because we didn't reverse it. We just had to multiply by two. So when we add our two modified equations together, like terms on both sides, the two moles of carbon dioxide, for example, they cancel out. One mole of oxygen cancels out with one from the four, so it's simplified to three. And now my target equation matches what I've got here from my modifications. So, so now, go ahead. If I may, uh, what we're doing here is because, uh, because we're given the enthalpies for both carbon monoxide and uh, I believe, uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to try to guess what CH4 is. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Because first off, because we have carbon monoxide as the product, yep. we first flip the uh, we first flip the uh, what do you call it the equation. I'm I'm going to say I, I'm just more talking about the actual enthalpy, but we flip the sign of it to become positive, yep. and then because the reaction is producing two carbon monoxides, we multiply it by two. Perfect. Yep. And then for the second one we just multiply it by we just multiply it by two as well without changing the sign because it's because the ch4 is still in the reactants right and then we've got two ch4 so we just multiply it by two to get the enthalpy for that yep perfect and then we just all right yes perfect and so our last step is now all we're going to do is we're going to add what i'll call delta h1 and delta h2 and so i'll say this was our delta h1 modified and then the second one here was delta H2 after we modified it, right? Equation one after modification, equation two after modification. And since we added those two equations together, we're gonna to do the same thing with the delta H's. We're just gonna add them together. So I'm gonna take, I know I'm kind of bleeding into the next example here, but I'm gonna take the 566.0 and add it to the negative 1780.6. And decimal place rule applies. So we'll go to the tenths place, so 566. We are subtracting because it's negative 1780.6, and I get a negative 1214.6 kilojoules. All right. And so if I'm going back up to my enthalpy of this, you know, equation that I was looking for, my target, that thermochemical equation, it would be negative 1214.6 kilojoules. And yet I wrote a J. There we go, kilojoules. So that's how we can solve for the enthalpy of a reaction only given enthalpies of different reactions, which I know seems kind of strange to do it this way. But um, basically, what I'll do for the next example is I'll, is I'll do it on a separate sheet of paper. And I think it'll kind of make more sense is that when we it's, look at, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's um, okay. So what we're finding in these equations is the delta H, right? Yeah, in this example, it, it'll ask for the enthalpy, and you're right, enthalpy is code for delta H. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, so what what I want to kind of show you with this with the next example, I'm just going to do it on a separate piece of paper because I think number one, I'm going to need more room, and number two, I want to sort of show you how the heat plays into this. Is that you want to remember that if your delta H is negative, that means energy is released; it's on the product side. And if the delta H is positive, that means energy is absorbed, which means it's technically on the reactive side. So we're gonna kind of see that when we go through this next example. But like I said, I think I'm gonna need more paper. Um, so bear with me, because I'm gonna have to write some things down. <laughs> okay, so I'm, on, I'm gonna do the next example. I just think I'm gonna need more space, All right? So equation one, rewriting it, these are my givens. So given in the example, let me just make sure, there we go. Um, the first one is we've got the ethene C2H4. I'm going to omit the states because I don't, I don't need the extra writing right now. Added to three oxygens to make two carbon dioxides and two waters. And that enthalpy is negative 1410.9. And we'll just know that all of these are in kilojoules. Again, I'm going to save myself the unit. All right. And then for equation two, 
I've got two ethanes, which is the C2H6, reacting with seven oxygens to make four carbon dioxides and six waters. And here, my delta H is negative 3,109.4, all right? For equation three, I've got two moles of hydrogen reacting with oxygen to make two moles of H2O. And my delta H here is negative 571.6 kilojoules. And our target equation is the ethene, the C2H4, reacting with H2 to make C2H6. All right, so that is that is our equation that we're looking to figure out what our delta H is. So I'll put that delta H is what? All right, so first thing is the discrete substances, right? Like what's gonna come from what, right? The ethene, the C2H4, when I look at that, it's only in my first equation. It's not in equation two, it's not in equation three. So the C2H4, this is going to come from equation one, right? The hydrogen, right? If I look at that, again, not in equation one, not in equation two, but it is in equation three. So this one, I'm going to write a little note. This is going to come from equation three. And then the ethane, the C2H6, that's in equation two, all right? So then I'm going to think about, all right, how am I going to have to manipulate each of these? So the first thing is the ethene, if I just deal with that first, because it's the first thing there, right? So I've got the C2H4. Number one, is it on the correct side, right? Well, in my given equation, it's on the reactant side. In my target equation, it's on the reactant side. So yes, it's on the correct side. Number two, these are the two questions you always have to ask. Does it have the correct coefficient in front? There's one C2H4, there's one C2H4. So basically, I'm not changing anything about equation one. The C2H4 on the reactant side, there's one of them. That's exactly what I need for my target equation. So equation one, uh, that's gonna stay as is. I'm not, I'm not actually gonna change any of it, all right? So equation one is gonna become C2H4, react with three O2s to make two CO2s and two waters. Right. And then what I'm kind of thinking about here is that energy, that 1410.9, um, that's released. Right. So I'm going to just put a little thing here. We're showing it's on the product side. And that heat is negative 1410.9. Right. And we'll come back to that later. Um, but I want to sort of show this that since it's exothermic, the energy is released. So the energy or that heat is on the product side. You'll see why I'm doing this in, in the next example. All right. Now, when I look at the equation two, we had talked about how what we need for equation two is the ethane, the C2H6. So when I go to look at equation two and how I'm going to modify it, what I first ask myself is, is the ethane on the correct side? No. It's on the reactant side. I need it on the product side. So already, I know I'm going to have to reverse the chemical equation. The next thing I have to do is ask myself, does it have the correct coefficient? No. In the target equation, it's got two moles. In the in my sorry, in the given equation, it has two moles. In my target equation, I only want one. So I'm going to take my given equation two. We talked about we need to reverse it and we need to cut it in half because we need two to go down to one, all right? So what I'm gonna do is reverse and multiply by a half. All right, so what's gonna happen now is um, my products are gonna become reactants. So four CO2s is now going to become two CO2s. My six moles of water is gonna become three moles of water, right? So my two products became my two reactants and I cut them in half. Now, the other product here is the heat. Again, it's exothermic, so that would be released. But if I'm flipping the reaction, that means the heat is now going to be on the reactant side because I'm going to change that sign. Delta H is going to become a positive. All right. So when you reverse a chemical equation, that's why the sign of delta H also reverses. Because if you think about this equation that we just wrote for uh, equation one, if I flip it, then my products become reactants and my reactants become products. And so that's why the sign on delta H changes. And hopefully that makes sense, right? If I go one way and I release energy, 
if I go reverse, I have to absorb energy. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to kind of show here with the H is that an exothermic becomes endothermic when you reverse it. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So those are my products, the CO2 and the water, right? Cut in half. Now let me do the same thing on the reactant side. They just are now gonna become products. So instead of two ethanes, I'm gonna have one. So C2H6. And then instead of seven oxygens, I'll have seven half, right? Or you could put 3.5, whatever you wanna do. So what am I gonna do to this value? Well, first thing is, I'm going to take the positive 3,109.4, because I had to change the sign on the delta H, and then I'm going to also divide it by two. So what that gives me is 3,109.4 divided by two, not 109, sorry, 119. I typed it in right, I just didn't say it right. I got 1559.7. All right, so that's what I did to equation two. All right, so this right here is delta H1 modified. This is delta H2 modified. Now, what are we going to do with equation three? All right, so for equation three, we talked about the hydrogen being important here. In my target equation, first question is, is it on the correct side? Yes, reactant and reactant. So I don't have to reverse it. The second thing is, do I have the correct co coefficient in front? The answer is no. I've got two in my given equation. I only want one in my target equation. To go from here to here, I'm gonna to have to multiply by one half. So instead of two hydrogens, I'm gonna have one on the reactant side. Instead of one oxygen, I'm gonna have a half. And then on the product side, instead of two waters, I'm just gonna have one water. So what happens to my delta H? I'm gonna take the 571.6, which is still gonna be negative, and I'm gonna divide it by two. So my delta H3 after modification, that negative 571.6 divided by two, I get negative 285.8, all right? So now what I have, I'm just gonna put these in parentheses so it's easier to find it later when I'm trying to add them together. Now what I should be able to do, oh, and the heat, right? It's still exothermic, so it's still on the product side. So now what I'm gonna do, uh, and actually, I don't like that because it looks like hydrogen. So let me just specify T. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna add those equations together. All right, so I've got my three manipulated equations. I'm gonna rewrite them. I know this seems a little redundant, so don't feel like you have to do it. I just wanted to make it clear on how everything is canceling out. All right, so equation one modified, we've got the C2H4 plus three oxygens to make two CO2s and two waters. And we said our delta H here is going to stay negative 14, 10.9. Second equation, we switched it, we flipped it. So two carbon dioxides plus three waters turns into the C2H6 plus seven half oxygen. Delta H here became positive 1559.7. And then the last one, the hydrogen plus a half of oxygen to become water. Delta H here, negative 285.8. All right, so I'm just rewriting what we already did in this section here. So kind of step-by-step -step process. I know it's a lot of writing, so I'm gonna lower this really quick. I'm sorry if you're copying it. So we start with what we're given and our target equation. First thing is equation one, what do I need to do to it? And we found that we didn't need to do anything to it. So we just rewrote it, left delta H alone. The second equation, we were looking at the ethane. We said, huh, we need to reverse it because we need the reactant to become a product. And then we also need to cut it in half. So we said, all right, reverse, cut in half. The two products became our two reactants, cut in half. Our two reactants became our two products, cut in half. So we changed the sign on delta H since we reversed the equation and we cut it in half. And so that's how we modified that delta H, right? For the third equation, the hydrogen was what we were focusing on. It was on the correct side, but again, we had to cut it in half. So we cut the equation in half, which meant we cut the delta H in half. And so now what I've done is I've just rewritten those three new thermochemical or modified thermochemical equations. So this was one, two, and three. Now what we should be able to do is add them together and cancel out like terms so that we end up with our target equation. All right, so on the reactant side, we should only end up with the C2H4 and the hydrogen. That means all the rest of this needs to cancel out. So let's see how this is gonna work. 
Okay, so first thing I notice is I've got two carbon dioxides on the product side in equation one. I've got two carbon dioxides on the reactant side in equation two, right? They look exactly the same, two and two cancel out. So those are gonna go away. The next thing I'm looking at is I have three waters on the reactant side in equation two, and I've got two waters plus another, so a total of three on the product side in equations one and three. So three, take away three. So all of those are gonna cancel out. I've got three waters on the product side and I've got three on the reactant side. So those, that's an equal net use of zero, right? Then the last one here is gonna be the O2. I know my purple doesn't show up too good. I have three oxygens on the reactant side plus another half. So really three and a half. And on the product side, I've got also three and a half. So now my oxygen is gonna cancel out. So what do I have left? I have the C2H4, the hydrogen, nothing else on the reactant side. That's good, because that's what my target says. And then I have just the C2H6 left on the product side, which is good, because that's what my target wanted me to have. So now what I have left is C2H4 reacting with the hydrogen to make the C2H6. So my delta H here for this reaction, I'm gonna take the negative 1410.9, I'm gonna add it to 1559.7, and I'm gonna add it to a negative 285.8, all right? So when you add those equations together, you just add all of those modified delta H values. So I've got 1410.9 negative added to 1559.7, and then added that to a negative 285.8. And I get here negative 137.0 kilojoules. So now that is my thermochemical equation. All right, so Hess's law, a lot of writing. You don't have to write that much out, thankfully. In fact, a lot of times on the quiz, I'm just gonna ask you like how you modify it. Did you have to reverse it? Did you have to multiply by a whole number or, or, or any number or fraction would work too? So those are the kinds of questions I'm gonna ask you. So just because, I, I mean, some of them I'll have you show your work, but you know, multiple choice, how do you do this? So like in this particular example, I might say, okay, based on the three equations you were given, which ones did you have to multiply by? Well, equation one, we didn't multiply. Equation two, we did. And equation three, we did. So you would say, okay, I had to multiply equation two and equation three. Or uh, another thing is I could give you this example and say, okay, which equation did you have to reverse? Well, we didn't have to do one or three, we just had to reverse equation two. So in a multiple choice way, we can still get the concept of Hess's law, you know, by making products become reactants or vice versa, or instead of two moles of water, we need one, that kind of thing, without having to do all of it. So that might shorten the work just a little bit, but you'll see that on the practice quiz. Um, otherwise, that's it for this chapter. It's a little bit shorter. I don't, I don't, oh no, it's not it for this chapter. I'm so sorry. There's still another example. We have to talk about enthalpies of formation. Um, but Hess's law, just do some practice. I, like I said, um, this is one that it causes students some problems. I, I, it, it's all completely new. Maybe that's part of it. But just do some practice. There's definitely some in the homework and the practice quizzes. Now, the last topic, right? Forgive me. There is one more thing to talk about. These are called enthalpies of formation. Um, and they're actually tabulated for you in your book. And you'll notice in the chapter seven folder, right above credit quiz six, right before the credit quiz for thermochem, I have another uh, chart, a table for the heats of formation. So if it's convenient, you can open that up and have that ready, or you can print it if you prefer to have paper or you can use the one that's in the Tro book. I will say the one in the Tro book is way more complete than this one. Um, but I went through the quiz and made sure that any enthalpies of formation that were not on that chart, because it's a little bit shorter, they're in the quiz question. So you can use the chart, even though it's not as complete as your textbook, you can use that for the quiz and you'll have what you need. Um, but this is how this works. This goes back to what we were talking about with, you know, when you go through a reaction, you have to break bonds, you have to form new bonds. And that can be a measurement of what's called an enthalpy of formation. So when you look at your, your table for enthalpies of formation, 
um, they can be kind of all over the place. Number one, you'll notice this little knot symbol, which means we're at a standard state. If we're talking about a gas, the pressure is at one atmosphere, temperature 25 degrees Celsius. If it's a solution, it's a molarity of one. Um, if that's what we're looking at, uh, some things will be solutions, some things won't. And the, if it's a compound, the enthalpy of formation is, is kind of looking at right, the enthalpy or the heat of forming that compound. So taking the elements in their standard state and forming that compound. Remember, that could be something measured in a bomb calorimeter or any kind of calorimeter, a certain kind of type of calorimeter. What we're going to do is we're going to have a chemical equation and we're going to be able to look up the heats of formation for the reactants and products. And this is what would come from the table or in this example, it's given in the book. And what we want to kind of think about is if something is formed, then that heat of formation is also formed. If something is consumed because it's a reactant, then those heats of formation are consumed. So what does that mean? When I look at this equation in the first example, when I make this ethanol, CH3, CH2OH, I release 277.7 kilojoules. Since ethanol is being made, that's how much energy is being released. When I make water, I release 285.8, but I'm not making it this time, I'm consuming it. So instead of releasing 285, I'm gonna be taking away, I'm gonna be using the 285. Same for the ethene. Normally when you make it, you have to absorb 52.26 kilojoules, but since I'm consuming it, it's gonna be the opposite. So basically, if you kind of, there's, this is the formula. I know that looks kind of, uh, ridiculously overkill, right? So we got sigma, which is sum, n is moles, and delta H of formation. This is for the products. And then you subtract out the reactants. So basically, we're going to take the 277.7 and minus the 280, negative 285.8 and minus the 52.6. So if I follow my formula for this example, my N for ethanol is just one. So that's what that's talking about there with the N. So this is just one times 277.7 negative. So on my product side, I've got negative 277.7. Then I'm gonna subtract what I have on my reactant side. And that's gonna be two things here. So the first thing is for the ethene, the 52.6, or sorry, 52.26 times again one, because it's a coefficient of one, and then added to coefficient of one, so one times the negative 285.8. So this is everything on my reactant side. This was everything on my product. And I don't know, I put, there you go, product side. So this is gonna simplify to negative 277.7 minus, and then let me get the sum of what's in that box. So I'm going to have my 52.26 minus, because it's a negative, 285.8. So I have a negative 233.54, right? So when you minus a negative, it's going to become a positive, right? So I'm going to have the 277.7, which is a negative, added to 233.54. So I get a negative 44.16 kilojoules. So this is another way of getting a thermochemical equation. So this is, remember how in the last, for Hess's law, we were trying to find the delta H for the reaction. This is another way of doing it. And I'm gonna round it to the tenths place only because of the, the 0.8 and the 0.7 would make me round it to the tenths place. So it's another way of getting our thermochemical equation, our enthalpy of the reaction. Instead of using like Hess's law did, different reactions to make a new reaction, what we're doing here is using what we know about forming these compounds, which are called the enthalpies of formation. So if we form that compound, that energy stays the same. But if we consume those compounds, we need to change the sign. So basically what we did is we took the negative 277.7 added it to now a positive 285.8, and then added it to a negative 52.26. That's kind of how I thought about it. But the way the books always do this is they subtract and keep the sign the same. But basically, these are enthalpies of formation, right? Which means production, 
So that's why the sign on the product stays the same, but the sign on the reactants is changed because instead of producing it, we're consuming it. All right, so here's another example using enthalpies of formation. All right, so this one, it says how much heat energy is released from burning one tank of gas. And um, we're assuming one tank is about 15 gallons of octane pure, which it's not, but we're just gonna go with it. And we are given the density of 0.703 grams per milliliter. So first thing is we're given heats of formation. So we're gonna need to first find the Delta H for the reaction, reaction abbreviated RXN. Now in this reaction, we don't have coefficients of one. So that's gonna be, make this a little bit different. All right, so first thing is I wanna look at the products. I'm having a hard time writing today, sorry. All right, so first thing, the products. So the carbon dioxide, I've got 16 of those and negative 393.5 is the amount of energy for each one. So I got to multiply that by 16. Then I need to add that to the 18 waters, each 241.8. Again, having trouble. Okay. So this is everything on my product side. So I'm just going to go ahead and get this first. So 16 times 393.5 and then that's a negative. So that is a negative 629.6. No, it's not. Oh, there's no point in it. Sorry. 6,296. All right. And then added to, I've got my 241.8 times 18, also negative. So negative 4,352.4. So let's get that total. So 4,352.4 negative added to negative 6296. So negative 10,648.4. So that's just for the products. All right. Now let's talk about the reactants. All right. So this is, I would say, part one. This is just the products. Now part two. For the reactant side, we had two octanes, negative two. Your camera's out of focus. Oh, it is, isn't it? Thank you, Adam. There it goes. No, it doesn't. Let me let me stop and start really quick. Sometimes that usually fixes it. Hmm. Okay. Why now? All right, let me try zooming out and zooming in. Okay. All right. I just need to bear with me five more minutes, camera. Okay, so negative 249.95. Thank you, Adam. I wasn't looking. All right. And then times two for the octane. And then for the oxygen, right, we've got 25 of those, but the enthalpy of formation, because that is the elemental form, so standard state, so you're, that, it's kind of like saying, that's how we find it in nature anyway, so we don't have to put energy into forming it, because that's how it is, right, so that's why it has an enthalpy of formation of zero, so 25 times zero obviously is going to cancel out, so what I've got here, 249.95 times two, negative 499.9 kilojoules, so that right there is my reactants. So I've got my two pieces at this point. That was my total enthalpy for the reactants, so two octanes. I've got my total enthalpy for my products, the 16 carbon dioxide and the 18 waters. Now what I can do is to get my delta H of the reaction is I can take my products minus my reactants. So the negative 2,648.4 minus the negative 499.9. All right, and obviously minusing a negative is going to make it become a positive. So I'm going to take my 10,648.4 negative and add to that 499.9. And so I get negative 10,184.5 kilojoules. So that would be my delta H for the reaction. All right, now I'm still not done because now now we have the thermochemical equation, but now we have to do the second part of it, which is how much energy is released from burning one tank of gas. So obviously I'm gonna to have to go to the next page for this. All right, let me get my folder, my yellow paper. Actually, I'll do it on the back of here. I think it's easier to see on the white paper. 
All right, so now the rest of this. I've got my thermochemical equation. I'm just going to rewrite it real quick. I've got my two octanes plus my 2502s to make my 16 oops, CO2s and my 18 waters. And delta H here, negative 10,184.5 kilojoules. All right, a lot of energy. One thing, let me also say this really quick. When you go to that table to look for the enthalpies of formation, be really careful about the state because when you're grabbing these enthalpies of formation from the chart, there's a different value for H2O liquid than there is H2O gas. So just pay really close attention to the state. There's a carbon dioxide solid, there's a carbon dioxide gas, right? So just just make sure you pay attention to it because on the table, you may not notice that. Um, so make sure you're grabbing the right one. Now, the second part of the question says how much energy? So the enthalpy is gonna be my B and we're burning one tank of gas, which we're assuming is 15 gallons of the octane and the density of that 0 0.703 grams per milliliter. All right, so a couple of things here to look at now that I have all that information. All right, so the octane is gonna be my A. It's gonna be my starting point. I have 15 gallons of C8H18. We remember one gallon is 3.785 liters from chapter one. One liter is a thousand milliliters. And then with the density 0 0.703 grams is equal to a milliliter. All right, so at this point we have our mass of octane, which is something that's a bit more familiar for us, right? And now we know to go to moles. So next thing here will be the molar mass. So I'll take eight carbons at 12.01 a piece and add that to 18 hydrogens at 1.01 a piece. So I have 114.26 grams per mole of C8H18. All right, so that's the molar mass. And since we want energy, the next thing that we're gonna put in here is our delta H value. That'll take us to energy. And sorry, that negative, I didn't can't copy that over. That was a negative. So negative 10,184.5 kilojoules is the amount of energy released every time I use two moles of C8H18, right? So that this right here is the new conversion step, right? This is chapter one with density, molar mass, and now this enthalpy, that's our new chapter seven. So when we found our enthalpy for the reaction, it was based on using two moles of C8H18. So that's what we plugged in here. And now we're ready to figure out our total enthalpy. So 15 gallons times 3.785 means we have about 57 liters times 1,000 means we've got about 57,000 milliliters times a density of 0 0.703 divide by 114.26. So we've got about 350 moles of octane. If I divide that by two and then multiply that by the 10,184.5, I have, let's see, to two significant figures. Let me write out what the calculator gave me. 1778803 kilojoules. So 1.8 times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, six kilojoules of energy and it's energy that is released or consumed during that combustion reaction. That's the energy that's used by your car for one tank of gas. All right, and again, that assumes that the octane is pure, but that's not true. But anyway, it's a it's a nice calculation to just sort of look at anyway. Uh, that eight didn't show up very well. Okay, so now we're at the end of our notes. <laughs> um, so that's the end of thermochem. The big thing with this chapter is, is seeing the relationship of delta H to the mole ratio and how that fits into stoichiometry. And then also those MCAT calculations that we did at the beginning of the chapter, looking at heat capacity and specific heat capacity. And we'll be looking at that in the lab. But the big thing, not anything quite messy like this, but the big thing is understanding how the thermochem part combines to the stoichiometry part, like seeing how your delta H relates to a substance in the chemical equation with the mole ratio, with that mole constant or mole coefficient. Um, and then Hess's law is also gonna be a big one uh, in this chapter. Like I said, that one usually causes trouble, but um, just practice it and let me know if you have any questions on it.
Um, but other than that, I think in this chapter, I always liked Thermo. I thought that it was easier for me than a lot of the other, than some of the other ones. I thought it was just really intuitive, like makes sense. If you get energy out going one way, if you reverse it, you got to put energy in. Definitely know the terms exothermic and endothermic and how that means if it's exothermic, delta H is negative. That means energy is released and that heat is on the product side. If it is endothermic, delta H is positive, and that means that enthalpy or energy is on the reactant side. It's being absorbed or used for the reaction to go forward. Um, but other than that, that's it for chapter seven. If you don't have any questions for me, I will see you back Thursday for chapter eight. Um, and don't forget kind of where we began today. I think I already took that piece of paper off, but your credit quiz four, which is chapter five, there it is is due tonight at 11 59 p.m all right so if you have any questions for me let me know but otherwise i hope you have a good rest of your day